And so they told us we had to hit the, the ships that were protecting the, the, uh, the, the landing of the Japanese to the north of us. And we had 500 pound bombs, so we hit the Japanese Navy. I don't know who we hit. They bounced off and we lost, we lost 11 of 18 aircraft. Murdered. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. Jack. Yes, sir. Tell us what you did during the Second World War. What was your job? My job was the pilot, and I was trained in low-level bombing and strafing. We were in support of ground troops who were making landings in the South Pacific, a series of islands which were basically being taken by the military strategists, whereby we would sort of cut off the Japanese. We were fighting, obviously, the Japanese, but they, we were always trying to bypass. And this was MacArthur's strategy, so that they would like, um, basically, he would let these islands or enclaves just wilt on the vine, so to speak, because we wouldn't let supplies get in. We'd just move up, and our job was to give as much ground support. So we had up aircraft that had not only a complete uh, ammunition, supplies of all kinds, bombs, as much as 1,000-pound bombs, or 500, all depends on what we had. We had what they call parafrags, little parachutes would be attached to a bomb, and they were all set so that with the air pressure, that at a certain altitude they would go off, the altitude being like 10 feet, 8 feet, 12 feet, and these were anti-personnel bombs. Uh, for instance, if you were bombing a, a big heavy, uh, heavily guarded places that have NA aircraft guns and everything, we just go over those, drop these parafrags, and these guys were all, would be start running out because P-38s would be above. And as the big guns are shooting, they would do vertical dive, strafe vertically um, there. So these gunners would be out running and when you drop the bombs like that, you wipe everybody out. Or and Jack B-38 was a was a fighter, and you were in a bomber. Yes, yeah. uh, it was a twin-engine bomber made by North America. It was had two 2,500 horsepower engines, and generally speaking, most of the islands of the Pacific are nothing more than a volcano. And so what you do is you go up to the top of the volcano. And most of the the military 
uh, emplacements were all right on the beach practically. So we would be in squadrons just gain, gain a lot of speed by coming down off the top of the, top of the uh, volcano and just go right over it. Now if you got hit, which was a possibility, that meant you could, you could dump your airplane or try to land it in, this, in the ocean. And then the Navy had what they called dumbos, and we had a four channel. If you have, have an emergency, anything like that, hit a button on four channel, you just say, Dumbo, I'm hit. I'm going to try landing I'm wherever I am. And they were hovering around there, and they were seaplanes, and they just come in, and you get out of the plane, get on the wing, and jump in a boat, and they take you. Jack, I'm sure many young Americans wanted to be pilots. Why did you want to be a pilot? And how did you, how were you uh, able to start? Well, I looked up to my brother who was two years older than I, and he had joined the Air Force. And he became a pilot, so he was my idol. And so I was gonna do what he did. And you decided to join? Uh, yes, I, I enlisted. Uh, we enlisted, or we were offered enlistment. We had to get uh, physical exams and everything. And I did that in August of 1942. But there were so many people enlisting and they had such a backlog that they accepted us when we passed the physical, which is quite, quite strict because of uh, <clears throat> Uh, eyesight was probably one of your most important physicals that you had. And how long did it take before you were able to start your pilot training? Uh, well, I, I was finally taken into the service uh, in March of 43. Uh, we went through basic training down at Keesler Field, which is in, near Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, and once we had completed that training, they sent us to uh, colleges because the training fields were crammed full of people. Uh, so they said, you just wait here until we get a space for you to get in. What kind of aircraft did you start on? Started on a, on a Piper, Piper Cub. And then we eventually, went up, we went, uh, we had what they called a Vulti vibrator, which was and the only reason that they call it vibrator because it shook and, and, and vibrated all over the place. But, uh, it was single engine, 450 horsepower engine. It was, a, it was a difficult airplane to fly because it, it had a, well, we used to call it glide angle of a crowbar. Can you tell us what happened to your family and, and, and see what was going through your mind, if any of that came back? What happened while you were in training uh, in, your, in your family? Well, my brother was killed during, during when I was in training. And uh, so I had to take, uh, I got, the Red Cross provides that you can go home, see your family, but my mother was the only one there, so I had to go home for two weeks. And Jack, how did you lose your brother? What happened to him? He was uh, on his last mission in Rabaul, and he was uh, leading. In fact, uh, he led the first mission, of which was an offensive mission against the Japanese, which was, he led six uh, B-24s uh, against the Wake Island. And that was from Hawaii, which got a big write-up, and it was the first time that we had counter offensed in the sense that uh, we had done something to the Japanese, probably hit nothing but prisoners of ours there, but uh, he did that. And then well, this was his last mission, and it was, Rabaul was the, the, the chief port for all the Japanese forces were, would branch out from that. And so when you hit that, and so I'd get letters from me, he'd say, boy, uh, yesterday we lost one engine, lost two, and what happened to him is he was down to two engines, and he was just coming in for a landing at Guadalcanal, 
and the left outboard engine gave out. Uh, it just went right over and punched in. And uh, four officers in the front were killed. And the six people in the tail didn't, didn't get injured at all. What was your first station in the Pacific? First station in the Pacific was a place called Finchhaven, New Guinea. New Guinea was controlled by the Australians. Uh, on, at, at, in this particular area. So we were, we were stationed there for a while. And what was the mission at that time? Oh, we had various missions. Uh, generally speaking, uh, some of it was only, if you look at the island of New Guinea, now it's like 1,500 miles long. So the Japanese would be in these places. We'd take oil and the uh, Japanese would be, they would get little pockets along the, the, the ocean and that's where, where they took it. I mean, if you went inland in the jungle, you look straight up, you couldn't see the sun. I mean, that's how, how you're, you're in the tropics. Uh, but uh, we would dump oil on everything that was around the, the Japanese camps. And the reason for that is it would kill all the crops because they were growing their own vegetables to support themselves. I think our missions uh, were patrol missions. We'd go out, we, these didn't get counted as missions. It was just uh, if we saw a submarine or if we saw some other ships that we couldn't identify, then we'd radio to somebody and they'd know what was going on in the air. I think it was more to give us some feeling that that we were fighting some of the war, but no bullets were fired or anything like that. Yeah, can you tell us what a typical mission was like from a pilot's perspective? Give us an example, maybe. Well, we would, we would get a, you never knew when you were going to fly. In, uh, rightfully so, for, for a purpose. I mean, probably wouldn't get a good night's rest if, if, if you did. But uh, you were summoned usually at three o'clock in the morning. Someone comes down, and so if you're a pilot, you're sent. Now you got to go for a briefing on pilots, and uh, usually the operations chief would be maybe a major or a lieutenant colonel would then have all the maps, everything. And so we're there. 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, we're getting the brief, and here's what you're going to do, and here's what's going to happen, who's doing what, and tell us, and, and everything else. You get a thorough briefing. And then what you do is, is uh, come out and look at the board, and you've got to look and see where your name is. And then I was a co-pilot uh, because uh, that's how you're assigned with the experience means I sit in the right hand side. And uh, so then you see that I'm in plane number, and you always go by the last three numbers of the aircraft. Most of them have six numbers, but you're in 307. And uh, so that's it, you're gonna fly with so-and-so. And all the others have been briefed who are there. In other words, the radio operators, the navigators get their briefing, bombardiers get their briefings and what they have to do, and then that's all coordinated, coordinated in the sense that we know that we're, we're going to take off. Usually when we did that, we would take off at 5 o'clock in the morning. Everything was silent takeoff. The tower would just, a light gun, green, green light meant you're ready to take off. So we knew, then we move out. We'd take off at 30 second intervals from mats that were, uh, there were mesh mats. Because it, what you did is you just picked up the air, airfield and when you moved to the next island, you got another one. And you always took off over the water and you landed coming in on the water because usually in all those islands, the volcanoes in the middle, 
so you're just going toward that. But and if we knew we had this and we'd take off at 30 second intervals, that's pretty close. So if I'm the third air, aircraft taking off, I take off right behind where the lead airplane takes off. And the reason is you don't want, you get what they call prop wash and the air is circulated like that. So you can get bounced around a lot. So you let the fellow on the right take as much of the right he can, you take that. Then we just pull in, then we fly formation. We'd have usually six airplanes in a formation. And depending on how many planes we're using, who's gonna be the lead. Uh, on my last mission, we were 100 and, about 110 aircraft, but we led a whole mission. At that time, did you have to worry about Japanese fighters? No, uh, because uh, they didn't want to waste their fighters, very honestly. I mean, uh, when I say waste, they didn't have, they have enough of them. But it's interesting because if the fighters would be talking to you as, and see, we, I'd be Roger Two. I'm the second guy down on the mission. So if Roger Two is leaving area, Roger Three is going to pick him up, and then we say, okay, good night and good luck. And that was it. So we, that's the way we signed off. But the Japanese are listening to us, and most of the guys went to schools in the United States. So they'd say, oh, Roger Two, uh, why don't you put your lights on? I can't see you. <laughs> you know, it's a, where the hell did you go to school? UCLA. Oh, I thought so. You don't speak English. You know, we'd be joking, you know, talking back and forth. Now, the reason they want to talk with you like that is to get a fix for you because they got radar and other things. But you're not supposed to do that. But anyway, you'd talk, but it was interesting to talk with these guys. Can you tell us about your experience in the Philippines, that part of the campaign? Yeah, these. Then it was starting to get a little rougher there because the Japs were. Uh, one bad experience I had was that, uh, and, and lady we were supporting that it was, it was crazy. The the uh, island of lady uh, was being invaded by the Japanese at the same time we were invading lady, and probably not more than than 30 or 40 miles away. And so they told us we had to hit the, the ships that were protecting the, the, uh, the landing of the Japanese to the north of us. And we had 500 pound bombs, so we hit the Japanese Navy. I don't know who we hit. They bounced off and we lost, we lost 11 of 18 aircraft. Murdered. During this period of time, what's your most memorable mission? The last one. <laughs> what happened, Jack? <laughs> well, we were leading a raid on Balika Papin, which was the toughest. That was most heavily defended. And we had uh, Admiral Kincaid had the seventh fleet. He had, I don't know whether they were bombing them or what, what they were doing. I mean, it, it, when you're in the war, you only do your thing. You really don't know what's going on next door to you at all. Or, or if you do, you probably not take it, minding your own job. But uh, what we had, it's the, we'd have these, we had to come down off. We had over 100 aircraft on this one. I was in the, I was a co-pilot for the commander. And we were coming down off the mountains. That's the way we get our speed, and we stay right on top of it. So we probably get an airspeed of three, 350 miles an hour. That's pretty fast for those things. And uh, the target was about 25 miles away. And we had to go over a little hill called Sugarloaf. It was just the name of the, the and uh, the flak was, was very heavy. In the meantime, when- Jack Flak, hmm? explain flak to us. Well, flak is anti-aircraft guns just shooting and, and, and it, it, the thing that you see it in front of you, you see these black bursts and all this and that, you know what they are. 
uh, make the plane bounce around, but that's it. And uh, so what happened was that uh, we were about 30, 20 miles away from the plane. Now we had to go over this little ridge because there's some trees, a lot of trees, and we were right on the deck. And uh, the navigator stands between the two of us. I'm the co-pilot on the right, pilot's on the left. He stands between us, and, and if he wants to go to the right, he'll tap my shoulder if he wants us over to the left, because he's the one who is directing us to the target. And the, the other guns are up at an altitude of about 25 to 20 to 25,000, 30,000 feet are heavy bombers. And they're carrying those for bombing the actual, for the actual facilities there. So heavy guns, what they call 80 millimeters, are shooting up at them. And we're, we've got anti fragment bombs against personnel and the people there and smaller bombs to drop and do the, the current. So, but in the meantime, the, we're going along and you're not aware of really anything happening. All of a sudden I heard pop or what I thought was because you have the windows not open but ajar. And so when everything's going wide open, the, 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 the racket is there, you got your headphones on. All of a sudden I look down, the pilot is like this, he's out. The, I didn't realize it at the time, but the navigator was killed. So we kept on going. The only place you could do is keep on going. And all my guns had been shorted out and they're firing because the only reason I know about that is when I went full flying over Kincaid's Navy fleet, uh, the, they were yelling at me. I could hear on the radio, but I couldn't do anything about it. And they're going to shoot me down if I don't quit firing on them and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> I was so upset, to say the least. But anyway, I really looked down. My arm was shattered from here. My leg was pretty badly gone. It was all shot up here. Because we have flak suits on, so you're protected. And the, and the only thing I had left, I didn't realize it, was the little half wheel. The only thing I had was the wheel, was this little thing left. Everything, all the dials and the instruments were shot out. The, the wheels with the pilot, everything was gone. And the windows on his side were shattered. And so I had to regroup. And I, the main, main, meanwhile, we're going at full wide open because you just put the, the throttles up against the firewall. In the meantime, they're taking these guys down into a little well uh, underneath. So I'm wiggling the wings like this for them because I'm the lead aircraft and I, I want somebody to come up. I can't lift this arm and somebody's got to bring, bring the, the throttles back. Otherwise, I'm just keep going, going. I couldn't do anything. So finally, the engineer came up. So I told him, I said, pull those throttles back again and get somebody alongside of me. And I was looking at So they finally saw that I was hit. So we have an alternative base to go back to, which was called Taui Taui. It was, it was about three hours back. And so I flew it back to its uh, base and made the most beautiful landing ever was. In the, the question in my mind is how? How did you do that? How were you well, able to, to keep on going? Well, I kept telling them to bring to me do. some morphine, which uh, according to, I found out later, but the, the, you're not supposed to have any morphine, but uh, they were, I was scared and, I could, and it hurt. So they came up and gave me a shot, and then they gave me a shot later, and then they were talking to the field on the radio, the radio operators there. And I had some guy bring me, lead me back, because he had to regroup them, take them back to our other base. And that was about five hours away, so we're briefed. If you get hit, here's where you land. So I landed at this place, and a beautiful landing. And uh, then when the guys out of the back end came out to the, the flight, 
you know, the, the gunners like that. One guy took a look at me and fainted. Were there any thoughts in your mind going back to your brother's death as you were bringing that plane in for a landing? None whatsoever. You, you were absolutely so engrossed in what you're doing. Uh, people say, or, aren't you afraid? You're not afraid because it's apprehension. If, when you're flying down to the mission, sometimes your mind might wander about oh, what can we run into or what could happen. But you've got a job to do, and that job has to be done perfectly, especially when we were in the lead aircraft. You have to keep everything perfect because the guy who's trailing on the outside, if you do something wrong, it's magnified 10 times at the 10th guy in line. And so you have to absolutely see that that airplane is cruising right at the perfect altitude, at the same airspeed, everything is done. So you're so engrossed in what you're doing. You only get scared or say, well, boy, that was close after it happens. Jack, why do you think it's important that, that we hear your story today? Well, so we're all going to be gone, so you won't be able to hear it. But <laughs> this is for posterity, for one thing. But it's, uh, it's to see that, that I want the, the people to know that when we were young and when we went to war, we were so dedicated and had such esprit de corps and camaraderie that, that we couldn't lose anything. We just knew. We're going to wipe everybody out. I mean, that was it. Uh, and what was the source of that? But what was driving you? Well, I don't know. When I, in the Air Force, we were told, you're the best. You're the cream of the crop. This was it. And after a while, that propaganda, you begin to believe it. You really do. But we were told that and we were good. Would you do it again? Yes, sir. In spite of all the difficulties, the injuries? There was no difficulty. I, I even enjoyed my hospital stay.